This is probably the first step in the gynecology stairway and understanding it properly is gonna win you extra confidence to go on to the other subjects. And what's even more important, vaginal discharge affects more than 75% of women at some point. So it's very likely that either a patient, a friend, or yourself will have it. So you might as well be ready and knowledgeable to treat or at least counsel about it. There are four entities that account for most vaginal discharge cases. Of course there are other diagnoses, but they're either outright obvious on examination, such as a retained tampon, or will have accompanying features such as vaginal atrophy. <laughs> the differences between these four are subtle enough that you're gonna have to do the mental exercise of going through the differential between them in pretty much every case of vaginal discharge that presents to your office. Just to bring you up to speed in case you're not familiar, candidiasis is a yeast infection that creates an itchy, curdy discharge. Vaginosis is a vaginal flora disruption that creates a smelly, thin discharge. <laughs> Trichomoniasis has symptoms that are roughly the midpoint between the two. And cervicitis is an STD that causes pain in the deeper end of the vagina. <laughs> okay, with that out of the way, let me go straight to the point and present you this table. The key differences that you're gonna need to tell each from each are all gonna be here, and I believe this is a much clearer way to understand these concepts than a plain narrative description of each disease at a time. I'll also try to use the least amount of words in each box so every concept can feel sharper and also help your graphic memory. These lines are the H&P findings, these are the ancillary tests, and these are the points on management. Okay, so for history and physical. Candidiasis itches, does not smell, and the discharge is curd-like on examination. Vaginosis does not itch, it does smell, and the discharge is gray transparent. Trichomoniasis kind of itches, kind of smells, the discharge is purulent, and the cervix can have a strawberry appearance. But even though this is the classical description, you'll almost never be able to see it with your naked eye. Cervicitis has unreliable findings in terms of itching and smelling. The most significant aspect is that on specular examination, you'll see that the discharge is actually coming from the ostium of the cervix instead of diffusely from the vaginal walls. Up until now, we were talking about conditions that affect mainly the vaginal walls, so the discharge is actually made up of transudation of fluid from the vaginal epithelium containing sloughed cells, bacteria, and etc. And the other thing you can see in cervicitis is that the cervix is friable, that is, it bleeds to light scraping. Okay, moving on to the bedside tests. What is used is pH indicators, the whiff test, which means literally taking a whiff of the fluid after applying potassium hydroxide, and plain microscopy, which is spreading some of the discharge on a slide and taking a look. Normal vaginal pH is low from conversion of vaginal wall glycogen to lactic acid by the flora. In candidiasis and cervicitis, pH remains low, while in vaginosis and trichomoniasis, the pH is deranged and therefore found to be high. The whiff test is positive in vaginosis and trichomoniasis also, and negative on the rest. On microscopy, they each have a specific finding. In candidiasis, you can see the fungus itself, either as pseudohyphae or as yeast, which show up better if you add potassium hydroxide to the discharge before looking. On vaginosis, you see the clue cells, which are nothing but the normal epithelial cells of the vaginal wall, but full of bacteria stuck to them. On trichomoniasis, you can see the actual bug, a flagellated protozoan, moving around like this. And on cervicitis, you actually won't see anything useful, unless you actually perform a gram stain, in which case you would see intracellular gram-negative diplococci. If what I just said is Greek to you, and you want to understand clinical microbiology better, I personally like the graphics that are on first aid, or if you happen to dig my didactics, post a comment saying so, and I will take note. But keep in mind that the best way to confirm these diagnoses is by detecting their genetic material in the secretions. And I must also add that, as the name implies, cervicides inflames the cervix. So aside from the discharge, these patients will often experience pain during sex and pain upon mobilizing the cervix. This is clinical information that you'll have to actively extract during the visit because, more often than not, people are reluctant to go around telling strangers about what they're feeling like during sex, and all the more so if it's a negative thing. Okay, and now to complete the table, management. First line medical treatment is topical azoles or oral fluconazole for candidiasis, 7-day metronidazole for vaginosis, single-dose metronidazole for trike, and single-dose ceftriaxone azithromycin for cervicides. And regarding follow-up for candidiasis, investigate possible diabetes and counsel them to wear lighter clothes and underwear. For vaginosis, there's usually not much to be done, but tell them not to douche because it alters the pH and lays the groundwork for bacterial overgrowth. For trichomoniasis, remember, it's a sexually transmitted infection, so you'll have to treat the partners and screen for other STDs. 
And for service IDs, same thing, treat the partner, check STDs. Ok, that's pretty much it. You could close this video and click thumbs up now if you wanted to, but if you'd like to hear some scientific gossip, hang in there. From looking at this table, you can see that it's very tempting to diagnose clinically and forego the ancillary testing since there seems to be always at least one clinical sign or symptom that differentiates a thing from the other. And in fact, relying on clinical diagnosis is routine practice in many settings around the world. Unfortunately, the real world is not so black and white. This study showed that the aspects that are considered the most reliable were, hmm, not so much actually. A sensitivity of 63% for the discharge being white in candidiasis, of 78% for perceiving odor in vaginosis, and of 50-89% to for the discharge being yellow in trichomoniasis. This other study showed that co-infection with cervicitis agents occurs in one in every four cases of general vaginal discharge cases. Because of all this, clinical practice guidelines strongly favor using bedside testing to diagnose these conditions. The CDC guidelines don't even acknowledge empirical diagnosis, and these European guidelines also state diagnosis powered by testing is the standard of care, although it allows for empirical diagnosis if testing is not feasible. The rationale for accepting empirical diagnosis, and therefore a generous degree of uncertainty, is that these conditions are not progressive diseases, and the medications are cheap and safe. Doing this comes with the cost of some women being falsely diagnosed with and treated for something that they don't have and experiencing symptoms for longer, but in situations where bedside testing is not available, it seems reasonable to tolerate this risk, telling the patient that she should come in for a follow-up visit, and if she doesn't get better, she'll be referred somewhere where she could get tested. <laughs> Ok, so with this out of the way, let's take another good look at this table and try to commit everything to memory. Print the screen and then try to fill it in by yourself. Do it once or twice until it starts to flow naturally. And that is it! I hope you liked watching this video, share it with your colleagues and loved ones if you think they might benefit from it, use the comment section below to suggest topics to help me choose which videos to do next, and stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.